section 8.7 is indeterminate forms and L'Hopital's ruler rule. L'Hopital. It is not the hospital. That's what people usually look at it and say. The hospital. It's not actually even phonetically where things are at all. This is L'Hopital. Okay? You guys got it? L'Hopital? L'Hopital. Okay, so we're going to take this little sort of detour, and there will, it will come about on, my, on Tuesday when we meet next time where you're going to see why we took this detour. But we're taking this detour back into limits briefly. Okay? That's what we're doing. Remember limits? Oh, yeah, I remember those. Like, that's Calc 1, like, two, first two weeks of class, right? Limits. The basic idea to evaluating limits was to somehow change the expression so that eventually you could plug the number in. You could evaluate f of a by taking the a and plugging it into the f of x equation. But there are some forms which you were not able to do this. Those forms were called indeterminate, and there are forms that have the evaluation 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, or 0 times infinity. Any of those are called indeterminate forms. When I was in grad school, I had a professor prove that 0 equals 1. Isn't that fun? He did it with indeterminate forms of limits. That's what he did it with. I don't remember his exact argument. And obviously, it's flawed because we all know 0 doesn't equal 1. But we used logic that people use all the time when you look at things that are in indeterminate form, right? So I'm going to show you how we deal with indeterminate forms, and it's actually very, very friendly. Are you guys ready? Very friendly. It's called L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule said, if you have, says, if you have functions f and g that are differentiable on the interval a, b, and c is between the a and the b, and you can't have that g of x is equal to 0. Okay, that's not allowed because that would actually give you the denominator of something later on is 0. Um, it may not actually have to be differentiable itself at c itself. Okay, so g of, g of c, not differentiable, g of c could actually equal 0. All right, anyway, the limit of f of x over g of x is equal to the limit of f prime of x over g prime of x. As long as f of x over g of x has an indeterminate form of 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. <coughs> Part of this um, theorem feels awkward to me, the way it's written, because they gave you the conditions at the end and the results at the beginning. So it's like they wrote it in like if then form, but they wrote the then and then they wrote the if. They said this is what's going to happen if you have the zero over zero or infinity over infinity. So the first thing you actually have to do when you're working with these is to test to make sure you really have zero over zero or infinity over infinity. Okay, so that's actually where we're going to start on the problems. And I want you to actually show me that you tested that by writing down the zero over zero or infinity over infinity because otherwise at some point, if you're really not testing, you're going to end up with something where the limits are not 0 over 0, and you're going to try using L'Hopital's rule, and you're going to get an answer that's going to be wrong, because the result does not hold if the indeterminate form is not there. Okay? So let's do one so you can see how easy these are to work with. Take a look. The first thing we have to look at when we're trying to find limits, or the first thing we're trying to do, is we're trying to plug 1 in. Agreed or negative 1 here? Sorry. The whole goal of limits is to try and change some expression, and this one can be done two ways, but I want to show you how to do it with L'Hopital's rule first, okay? If you try to plug negative 1 into this numerator, what do you get? You get 0. And if you try to plug in this negative 1 to the denominator, what do you get? 0. So it has the indeterminate form, agreed? Yeah. So this means I can apply L'Hopital's rule, and I usually just put an L in here so that I remind myself that L'Hopital's rule actually will work on this. And what L'Hopital's rule says is that not that the answer to this function is going to be the same, but that the limit is going to be the same as if I took the derivative of the numerator and the denominator separately. I'm not quotient ruling this. Okay? I took a noun and I turned it into a verb. Did you hear that? That's what I did. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to use the quotient rule. 
I'm going to take the derivative of the numerator and write it down. So what is the derivative of the numerator? 2x minus 2. What is the derivative of the denominator? It's 1. And I'm going to try to evaluate this by plugging the number negative 1 in again. And if I plug in negative 1 here, what do I get? Negative 4. And this is the limit. That's exactly how simple this is. There's no, or it could be more complicated if we do this kind of thing. Now I want to show you that this actually matches up with another way that you've done this particular problem before. This particular problem actually could also be done by factoring. Mm -hmm. So if you factored the numerator, it actually has an x plus 1 in it um, times x minus 3. This is the only way you would have been able to do it prior to L'Hopital's rule. You could factor this. You'd cancel these out. Right? And if you evaluate this by plugging in negative 1 now, you still get, whoops, 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 get carried away. So you still get negative 4, right? Now, that was, that was kind of friendly because of this particular function. It happened to factor. And so I gave you this example on purpose at the beginning so I could show you that I wasn't trying to sort of like pull the wool over your eyes. I'm not trying to be tricky or show you something that didn't work. It, it really matches what you've done before on this particular problem. The next ones we're going to do, though, don't even have the ability to be factored like this. Okay? So L'Hopital's rule becomes absolutely crucial in order to doing the next problems because natural log of x squared does not, does not factor, right? Now, um, it does have the ability, natural log of x squared, to be written differently when we do the derivative, and I think that's probably a good step. But before we do anything, we've got to determine if it's in the indeterminate form. It sort of sounded ox oxymoronic, didn't it? I told you we're going to determine if it's in the indeterminate form. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to try to plug in 1 and see what happens. So if we plug 1 into the natural log of x squared, well, that's 1 squared, that's 1. What's the natural log of 1? 0. All right, what happens to the denominator? 1 squared minus 1? 0. So this does, in fact, have the indeterminate form we need to apply L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. And like I mentioned before, it would be helpful to rewrite this before I take the derivative because I don't really want to do a chain rule. I mean, like you can if you want, but I have no desire to do that. How could I rewrite this? 2 natural log of x, right? Because the 2 can come down. Okay, so if I take the derivative of this, I've got the 2. What's the derivative of ln x? 1 over x. What's the derivative of my denominator? 2x. You can clean this up if you want, but you don't really need to. What you really need to do is to plug in 1, right? Yeah. And what happens if you plug in the number 1? Well, you get 2 times 1 over 1 times or divided by 2 times 1, which gives you 1. And you're done. that easy. Okay. Well, the next one looks harder. It really isn't. I think it looks harder partially because you got a random A and B going on in there. They don't really affect anything. What happens if you try to plug 0 inside times AX? You get 0. 0 times BX is 0, right? Okay, but what is the sign of 0? What is it? It's 0. If I try to plug 0 in here, I get 0. And I get it on the top and the bottom, which makes it indeterminate form. So I can use L'Hopital's rule. Fabulous. So then, what in the world is the derivative of sine of ax? A cosine of ax. And what is the derivative of sine of bx? B cosine of BX. 
what happens when I plug zero inside of cosine now? We get one. So on the top, I have a times one. On the bottom, I have b times one. So what's my limit? a over b. Because anything times zero would be zero. That's why. If there were addition or subtraction, we'd have to be concerned, right? Because that wouldn't always work. But with the multiplication, it's very friendly because it ended up with a zero there. Very friendly because of the multiplication. All right, so every single one so far has ended up with zero over zero as my indeterminate form. And I would be a terrible, terrible teacher if that's the only ones I gave you, wouldn't it? So what's happening on this one? Okay, so we, we understand we're all on the same page that we can't really plug infinity into something, right? But we do have the right idea if we try to think of taking something and it gets infinitely large, you know, larger and larger and larger, and cubing it. And when we do that, we get something that's even larger, right? So the, the concept here is not the numerical value, but the concept is still that it's infinite on top. And if you put in something that's e to something that gets infinitely larger, if you'll remember the graph of e to the x looks like that, e to the x squared isn't quite the same thing, but on the right-hand side, it's doing the same thing. This is also getting infinitely larger. So we have an indeterminate form that is, in fact, infinity over infinity on this one. Okay? So we do have L'Hopital's rule. It does work for the limit going to infinity here. And I can take the derivative. So what is the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. What's the derivative of e to the x squared? 2x. 2 x, yeah, e to the x squared. Okay. Before we try to, I mean, the problem here, of course, is that's still infinity on top and infinity on bottom, right? Before we go trying to apply L'Hopital's rule again, we should probably clean it up because I don't know about you, but I'm not really interested in doing a product rule on bottom if I don't have to. So will this clean up? Does it simplify? Yes. One of these x's here, and this x here will reduce themselves, right? So I can actually take this and rewrite this. I'm not doing any new actual operations. I'm just revising how it's written as 3x over 2e to the x squared. OK? So at least it's simpler to work with. However, if I try to plug in infinity, terrible language, but pretend, what does it give me? I've still got infinity over infinity. Right? But infinity over infinity is an indeterminate form, and L'Hopital's rule will apply. So I can use a second step of L'Hopital's rule inside the same problem. Totally, totally valuable to do. So if I take this now, and I've got the limit as x goes to infinity, what's the derivative of the numerator? 3. What's the derivative of the denominator? 4x e to the x squared. Now. At this point, some people might think, well, I'll just apply L'Hopital's rule again. But you can't, because the numerator is no longer infinite, right? The denominator is, but the numerator is not. The denominator is constant. So what happens when you have a constant numerator and you're dividing it by something that's getting infinitely large? It goes to zero. So in some sort of sense, when you test this, you get three over infinity. That's what you're thinking, right? And this value is a limit of zero because you're dividing a constant by something that's getting infinitely large. So the limit's zero. Okay? What do you think? Is it a breath of fresh air? I kind of feel like in the middle of all of the, the difficult integrations that we're doing, it's a breath of fresh air.